Thank you. I'm here to talk to you about something that I've never spoken about in public. I've had conversations with friends and family, and I've written a lot of this in the pages of my journals, but I've never actually shared what I'm going to share with you today anywhere publicly. I felt, it felt like I was walking through knee-deep snow to prepare for this. I considered backing out a few times. I really, really labored over every word. But what I really realized in the theme of today's TEDx gathering, which is opening, that it made perfect sense for me to open today in a way that I'd never opened before and share with you a piece of myself. So thank you for being here to receive it. It's the ripples, the ones that happen when you toss a rock into a still body of water. Not a pebble, but a rock, one that really has weight. You can feel it in your hand. And it's so heavy that when you pull it back to throw it, your arm has no choice but to follow through because the rock has that weight. And it's at that moment when we were children that we'd hold our breath in anticipation of what it meant to have that rock hit the surface and break the surface of the water. It makes this noise, like no other noise, which is like a kerplunk, when the rock falls into the water and the water opens to receive the rock and the rock drifts down into the water and the ripples start. I see those ripples as openings, rippling open. I have looked at my life in the last eight years as a series of ripples. Ripples that are brought on by a smell or a photograph or a memory. Ripples that started when I was 33 and I remember the exact moment when the phone call came that would lead to the unfolding of information the rock that lobbed into my body of water, that my mother was dead, brutally murdered and tortured by someone that I trusted. In those moments, those early moments, the ripples were physical. They were the tearing open, the grief, the uh, adrenaline, the nausea, the fear coming through my body. I felt so wide open that was I, while I walked in the world, I was worried about a grain of sand or dirt getting sucked into me and I'd never be able to find it again. In the basement of the police station, cold, I participated in the ritual of moving in and out of space. I would go to the bathroom to wail and to cry and to vomit. I would be listening and hearing more information than my mind could take in. I was looking at my baby sister's face in anguish. I knew in that moment that I was open in such a way that I didn't know if I'd be able to ever put myself back together again. In that openness, I laid in my estranged father's arms in the Oakland airport baggage claim, waiting for my grandmother to come in from Florida, my mother's mother, who just 24 hours before, I had to tell her that her only child was dead. The ripples were so intense. While I laid in the airport, I knew people looked at us, my crumpled family laying, and people would look at us with pity or disdain or curiosity, and I should have felt fear. I was more vulnerable than I ever had been, but instead of fear, I felt safe in my human family. It was like I could instantly know that people who were looking at me also carried their own pain inside of them that in seeing me there, that they knew that they were connected to me in a way that they never would have seen had I come in my normal detached human form. There were so many decisions, decisions that had to be made quickly, the funeral home, the coroner, the police department, the interviews, I became the instant matriarch of my family. I felt like I was drowning that in drowning, I had my head tipped back in the water, just trying to grab a last breath. In the openness, I didn't have any frame of reference for it at that moment, but now I do, and that reference is in childbirth. 
I gave birth to my own daughter five years ago, and I didn't realize it at the time, but the choice I made to have an unmedicated birth was, had a ramification I never expected, which was that it brought me close to that emotional, spiritual, and physical opening that I had had in my mother's death. It was like my midwife kept talking to me through childbirth preparation and through labor, and I didn't really make the connection, but she kept saying, open, like you're gonna allow your body to open and you're gonna allow your child to be born, and that in that pain, you're going to get great reward. That you shouldn't resist the pain, but you need to go into the pain. And in going into the pain, you'll open, and I did open, and my daughter came into the world. We need midwives for grief in our world. In those months after my mother's death, I navigated it alone. I didn't have someone who could help me learn how to open, how to move through it, and how to be carried by it. We need a revolution in our world about how we talk about death, especially sudden and traumatic death. I was no stranger to violence or to grief prior to my mother's death. I've worked with women and girls in crisis for 20 years, and I've always carried a deep love and incredible compassion for these women and girls, but it wasn't until my mother's death and their letters began to arrive that I, they really became part of me because in their own trauma, they could speak to me in a way that nobody else could. They were midwives in some ways to me, in that I got to hear from them that they knew exactly what state I was in, because it was a state that they had been in. After the ripples slowed down, I found myself wanting more ripples. I actually craved them. The ripples were painful, but when they weren't coming at that same clip, I felt myself start to close down. I felt myself start to become numb by the stimulation and the commotion in the world. I became more closed, and I needed to stay open. I couldn't close down again. And so I worked really hard at it. I actually had many healing and much sort of expected back sliding as I went through the process of the grief in court, sitting feet behind my mother's murderer, staring at the back of his head, and his eventual sentencing, where I stood in front of him and looked him in the eye and told him about the agony he created in the world and that he alone was responsible for the reverberations of that agony. I told him I took comfort in his eventual death and that he wouldn't be able to hurt anyone ever again. I held a picture of my mother so big so that he couldn't avoid seeing her face as I spoke to him. When I left court that day, I really entered into the world of after. And my work in the world has been to continue to receive the ripples and to stay open. I stay open and I try to be connected to that so deeply through our unifying pain. Everybody in the world has a deep and traumatic place in them that has experienced loss and pain. All of us in this room have it, and it's what connects us through our ability to open to it. People tell me all the time, sometimes when they know how my mother died, sometimes they just tell me, I, maybe I just attract it because people know I have that experience and they can see my openness, but they tell me all the time about someone they love was murdered, somebody was suicided, somebody was assaulted, that they've lost a child. And in those moments, I can connect to that openness and those ripples. The ironic place that I experience it most is when I'm driving and somebody beeps at me because I can't, I didn't turn fast enough or they flip me off or they look at me with that angry scowl through the glass of their car door and I just remember and try to remember that that anger is an expression of pain and that pain is pinballing around inside of them looking for an opportunity for them to open 
for it to come out, and for them to get closer to their own heart. I'm now on a journey to find out what forgiveness means, and if I can forgive the man who murdered my mother. I don't know where that journey will take me, but if I remain open, I believe that I'll find my way in that journey as well. Thank you.